my name is Jim Hadley, and at the beginning of each of these 10-part programs, I'd like to just give you a little bit of an idea about the point of view from which I approach the subject matter. Museums like this display what are called, in the most general sense, works of art. But what gives a work of art its value? Why do we put it in a place like this? If you're familiar with the typical art history text, you've been led to believe that what's most important, what's most valuable about a work of art, is what it looks like. Art historians try to convince us of this by talking above all else about things like dramatic intersecting diagonals, monumental groupings, lines, forms, and so on. Sometimes this kind of language can be pretty far from useful, however. Take this example from Bruce Cole and Adelheid Galt's book, Art of the Western World. Rationality and irrationality are woven together as line defines volume here and denies its existence there, as gold implies space in one spot and affirms a flat surface in another. Irreconcilable differences somehow coexist here. Would you say that this description fits this picture? Sounds like it could to me, but in fact, it's a description of this 14th century enunciation by Simone Martini. Maybe this is a little unfair of me, but only a little. I can just imagine Bruce Cole or, say, Kenneth Baker trying to describe a man who'd robbed him to the police. They'd never catch the guy. But the real point I want to make isn't that the language of art historians is often more likely to produce puzzlement or laughter than insight. The point I want to make is, rather simply, just that this kind of language leads us to concentrate on appearances. This is a problem because when art historians leave their books, as it were, and come out in the real world, it sometimes seems as though what a work of art looks like counts for almost nothing at all. For example, the New York Metropolitan Museum used to have what was supposed to be an ancient Egyptian bronze cat on display. It was one of the most popular items in the museum until it was discovered to be a forgery and immediately removed. Not because of anything connected with its appearance, but because it was made using a technique unknown to ancient Egyptian artists. The Rembrandt Research Committee is currently providing many relevant examples of this sort of thing. These fellows are trying to establish which alleged Rembrandts are actual Rembrandts. The Berlin Museum's Man with a Golden Helmet here is one of the relatively few well-known pictures formerly attributed to Rembrandt to be reattributed by them, and it is one of the relatively few quantum Rembrandts, whether well-known or not, still on display, although it too has been demoted from what Steve Martin calls Rembrandt wow to Rembrandt yeah right. Of the 12 alleged Rembrandts, for example, that the RRC says are not Rembrandts in the Washington National Gallery, only one is still on display at all, yet not one looks any different than it did before the RRC's investigations. We didn't see any headlines that read, say, Rembrandt found with diagonals that no longer intersect. Copies of Durer engravings, indistinguishable from the original to the naked eye, are available to anyone with a nickel for a Xerox machine, while the originals are valued as great works of art, how can this be explained if the appearance of a work of art is the main thing that makes it valuable to us? What these kinds of cases illustrate is that there is a radical inconsistency in the way art historians do business. What is valuable about a work of art is obviously something much more complex than just what it looks like. We don't have time to go into this in a lot of detail here, but I think the most important factor determining the value of works of art at least of the sort that get into art history texts, is what we might call their evocative power. Consider this case. Suppose you have a picture on your desk which you think is a portrait of you drawn by your daughter when she was six. And then one day your now grown daughter comes in and says, Dad, I have a confession to make. You know that picture on your desk that you think is a portrait of you by me at the age of six? Well, Dad, I didn't draw that. Remember little Betty Kowalski down the street? She drew it, and it's not you at all, Dad. It's supposed to be Paul McCartney. You might still keep the picture around, put it in the bottom drawer of your desk, sort of your equivalent to the depot where the Washington National Gallery stores its pseudo-Rembrandts, but your attitude to it has changed entirely. Not because anything about its appearance has changed, but because its evocative power has changed.
Now, to an art historian, Rembrandt is practically like a member of his own family, and when something thought to represent him is found to be false, this changes his whole attitude to the work, regardless of the fact it still looks the same. But for the evocative power of works of art to affect us, for them to serve as the exalted souvenirs of the whole cultural context out of which they come, we have to be familiar with those contexts. We need to know about their subjects, the subjects of the works of art, and about religion, politics, the other arts like literature and music, the whole cultural package, if works of art are going to be anything more than collections of dramatic intersecting diagonals and monumental groupings, lines defining volume and colors implying space in one spot and a flat surface in another. This way of approaching the history of art tends to blur the distinction between works of art and historical artifacts, as they might be called, between things like, say, the Mona Lisa and things like, to take an extreme case, Napoleon's toothbrush on display in the Carnivalet Museum in Paris. And different as the interest we take in the one may seem from the interest we take in the other, in this pair of extreme examples, their value to us comes ultimately from a common source, their evocative power. In fact, almost anything old enough or evocative enough comes to be treated like a work of art, whether it was meant to be one or not. In the end, and I think this is an important point, history itself comes to take on much the quality of a work of art, in which we judge events not so much by moral standards, but by whether or not they are interesting or enlightening or moving. A sort of corollary to this is that something that didn't happen, like the Trojan War, can have much more importance than lots of things that really did happen, and Odysseus and Hamlet can be as important as Henry VIII and Napoleon. This may also seem like a rather extreme position at this point, but I think what I mean will eventually be both clear and persuasive if you stick with these lectures long enough. The general purpose of the lectures, then, is just to tell enough of the story of the Euro-Mediterranean chapter of this whole unfaded and substantial pageant that is sometimes called the history of civilization to allow us to increase our appreciation of the value of the souvenirs of it that we have, whether they are works of art, music, literature, battlefields, buildings, tombs, or toothbrushes. Et bien mes amis, à la fin. We'll begin this quarter with just a bit of an overture or preview of coming attractions to give you an idea about where we're going and what we'll be seeing. We'll be starting in Spain, and this is the Escorial just outside Madrid. The period we're covering this quarter, essentially the 16th and much of the 17th century, includes the greatest age in the history of Spain and its art. Cervantes, El Greco, Loyola, and St. Teresa were all contemporaries of Philip II who built this. We'll also spend time in the Spanish Netherlands, Belgium and Holland as we think of them now, which were part of Philip II's inheritance from his Habsburg father as we'll see. You probably don't think of Peter Bruegel, the greatest Flemish painter of the day, as a Spanish subject, but that's the way Philip thought of him. And Bruegel is a very important painter, perhaps the man we should consider, the first true genre or ordinary life painter, and he's sometimes called the first true landscape painter, and it can be claimed that he's the first great painter to do nothing for the church. We'll also be in France to see Chenonceau and a lot of other fine buildings. It's been said, in fact, that the finest domestic architecture ever built was put up in France in the 16th century. We'll hear about how Henry II's wife and his mistress both lived here, but not at the same time. In England, we'll also see a lot of fine buildings like Hatfield. If you take the claim that evocative power is a big part of what makes a work of art valuable, seriously, buildings are especially important because we can go right inside them and pretty much be surrounded by another century in a way that most other works of art, of course, just don't allow. The 17th century is certainly the greatest century in the history of English literature if you put Shakespeare in it. And as we heard last quarter, several of his most important plays were written after 1600. 
And even without him, it has the King James Bible, Ben Johnson, John Milton, John Donne, the Cavalier Poets, Thomas Brown, Robert Burton, and a host of others. We'll also hear about the English Civil War. Charles I had the poets on his side, but Cromwell had money on his, so you can guess who won. We'll also see the work of Peter Paul Rubens this quarter. The 17th century is the Baroque age with a capital B, and he's the most representative Baroque painter, as well as one of the most successful artists ever, the friend of kings and princes. Rembrandt is, however, the greatest painter of the age, and many opinion polls would give him the title greatest painter ever. He was overshadowed by Rubens in the eyes of their contemporaries, but he too, despite some legends that are hard to kill, was very successful. This self-portrait was painted the year he bought a house in Amsterdam that cost nearly as much as Rubens' palace in Antwerp, although Rembrandt somehow managed to squander the equivalent of millions of dollars and died poor. This makes people feel sorry for him, but speaking from the perspective of someone on a teacher's salary, I've always found it a little hard to be very sympathetic to spendthrift bankrupts, even if they're geniuses. The 17th century is the greatest in the history of Dutch art, and we'll hear also about painters like Vermeer, Roystal, Halls, and Rembrandt's other contemporaries. This is a picture of a 30 years war battle by Philip Vuvermans. The 17th century is pretty much an age of specialization in the arts, and Vuvermans' specialty was battles, and the 17th century certainly provided a lot of material for him. I mentioned the English Civil War. We'll also hear about the Thirty Years' War, perhaps the most destructive in European history, at least before the 20th century. The Thirty Years' War was a very complicated affair, but as we'll see, it was essentially a war between France and its Protestant allies on one side, and the Habsburgs in the Holy Roman Empire and Spain, and their Catholic allies on the other. This is a portrait of Philip IV of Spain by Velasquez, Spain's answer to Rembrandt and Rubens. Philip IV himself was not a great general. He spent more time in Velasquez's studio than on the battlefield. While the Thirty Years' War was going on, the most versatile genius of the day, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, was working in Rome. He was the last architect of St. Peter's and its chief interior decorator, as well as the greatest sculptor of his day, a painter and a writer. And in 1665, he went to France to work for Le Roi Soleil, Louis XIV. Whose reign lasts so long, we won't finish it till next quarter, but we will hear a lot about him in this series and we'll wind up with a visit to Versailles we men have just sort of lost Louis's flair, I think, for accessorizing. Someone has said he looks here like Homo Gallicus in full spring plumage. We'll also hear a lot about great music this quarter from Victorian Cabazon in Spain to Laws in England, Lully in France, Buxtehude and Schutz in Germany, Swaylink in Holland, Frescobaldi in Italy, and we'll hear from many others well and not so well known. So that's the program for the quarter then, and now we'll begin on page one. The last time I talked very much about Spain was in the class on the Middle Ages when we heard about how the Iberian Peninsula was overrun by the Arab-led armies of Islam in the 8th century and about how the Reconquista led by Alfonso VI who retook Toledo in 1085 and Alfonso VIII who defeated the Muslims at the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa and Fernando Santo who retook Cordoba and Seville eventually re-established Christian dominance. By the end of the 13th century, only a small part of Spain around Granada was still in Muslim hands. This is the Alcázar in Segovia, one of the most impressive surviving architectural relics of this era in Spanish history, 
It was essentially built by Henry of Trastamar in the 14th century, and then enlarged in the 15th by his great-grandson Juan II, the father of Queen Isabella. Here's another view of the Alcázar at Segovia. In 1469, a wedding took place between Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile, which went a long way toward creating modern Spain. When Isabella then succeeded to the throne of Castile five years later in 1474, and Ferdinand succeeded to the throne of Aragon five years after that in 1479, Spain became essentially the geographical and political state which we still recognize, with, again, the exception of the area around Granada in the south. Like a lot of great rulers, Isabella was lucky to get to the throne at all. She was a woman to start with, and Castile had never had a queen regnant. She also had a brother, Henry IV, who preceded her, and if there had been any children who were clearly his, Isabella would probably never have gotten to the throne at all. Fortunately for her, he was not known as Enrique el Impotente for nothing, and although intermittently he supported the claims of the girl known as Juana la Beltranea, who probably was his daughter but was widely alleged to be illegitimate, he finally acknowledged Isabella as his heir here in Segovia in a famous episode in 1468 when he led her horse from the castle to the cathedral. Henry died in 1474 while Isabella was also here and she was then crowned Queen of Castile here as well. This is now the Alhambra at Granada. This was mostly built by the Islamic Nazra dynasty, which ruled here in the 13th century, as we saw in the class on the Middle Ages. But Charles V, the grandson of Isabella and Ferdinand, about whom we'll hear more later, put a 16th century palace in the middle of it, and it has been altered in many other ways over the centuries. In 1478, the Emir of Granada, Muley Hassan, and keep in mind that Arabic names have to be transliterated, and there's not always unanimity among scholars about just how this should be done, Muley Hassan refused to pay the tribute that had been the price of Islamic existence in Spain, and the long struggle over Granada began. In the end, trouble with his women, his brother, and his son did about as much to undermine his position as the Christian armies did. His son Boabdil nominally succeeded him in 1485, but he was not a great leader, and the Christian siege of the city, which began in 1491, led to his surrender in October of that year, and on January 2nd, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella entered the city. Traditionally, the surrender of Granada is said to have been formalized in the Torre de Comares of the Alhambra. Comares was apparently the architect of this section of the palace. It is also called the Hall of the Ambassadors and was frequently used as a throne room. By the surrender agreement, the Muslim population was allowed to continue in its faith under the governorship of Cardinal Talavera. But this was an arrangement that was doomed from the start and in 1502 all Muslims were required to convert or leave Spain. For the Jews, the situation was even worse. Their expulsion was decreed immediately after the surrender of Granada. It was taken for granted that political unity required religious unity, and Torquemada and the Inquisition would do the job of seeking out insincere converts and punishing them as was deemed appropriate. We'll hear more about the Inquisition in a bit. This room was also traditionally said to be the place where Isabella had her famous interview with Columbus in 1492. He had probably first met Isabella and presented his case at Cordova in 1486. This had led to the formation of a committee under the leadership of Diego de Deza, who was a professor at the University of Salamanca. <laughs> Exactly where this committee met isn't certain, but many, including Samuel Eliot Morrison, reasonably think that it met at the Dominican convent of Santo Domingo in Salamanca, which you see here today. The Church of San Esteban, as it stands, now is 16th century on the left. Diego de Deza favored giving Columbus his chance, 
but the committee did not come to a decisive conclusion. After Columbus again met with Isabella in 1491 during the Siege of Granada, another committee was formed which likewise refused to recommend his plan. It is, of course, not true that the reticence to sponsor him had anything to do with the belief that his project would simply sail off the edge of the world and thereby be proven a bad investment of royal money. We don't have time here to go into details about the history of cartography and so on, but scholars had known since antiquity that the earth was round. Eratosthenes is usually given credit for first establishing this all the way back in the 3rd century BC. The question was rather how far one would have to sail west to reach Asia. Columbus was convinced that the distance was much shorter than it in fact is. The scholars were right in refusing to sponsor him. He had no chance of reaching Asia. Despite the committee's decision, however, and although the exact details of how this came about are still argued over, Isabella finally did give her approval, and he set sail in the euphoria after the fall of Granada. <laughs> Miraculously, Columbus ran into land just about where he expected, or led others to think he expected, to find it. And to his dying day, he apparently believed that the West Indies were the East Indies. The facade of the university here, perhaps the work of Enrique de Egas, who's connected with a lot of important things in Spain at this time, is often considered the finest example of the Plateresque style in Spain, Plateresque means something like in the manner of the silversmiths. The decoration, which is characteristic of the style, is not an integral part of the architecture, so it is said, but is rather like a plata of lavish ornament attached to it. It's sometimes suggested that there is something of the Muslim aversion to undecorated surfaces in this. The medals on the facade honor Ferdinand and Isabella, who were supporters of the university. Their son Juan was a student here at the time of his death. One of Isabella's best friends, Beatrice de Galindo, was the first woman professor here and helped Isabella to learn Latin when she was 40, which speaks well for Isabella's intelligence. By the time most of us are 40, our minds are too full of football scores and recipes and things like that to successfully take on the challenge of learning a new language. Here in front of the university, you can see a statue of Luis de Leon, another famous professor here in the 16th century, who is one of Spain's greatest poets. He's even been called the greatest Spanish poet, although he is not well known in the United States. Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros was also a graduate of Salamanca and was to become famous for his work on the so-called Complutensian Bible, the first complete printed edition of the Christian scriptures in the original Hebrew and Greek. He was broad-binded enough to try to get Erasmus to come help him, but as we've heard in previous uh, classes, he was working on his own Greek New Testament. Erasmus may also have been put off by the fact that Cisneros was the Grand Inquisitor of Spain. The Inquisition was, from a kind of absolute subspecie eternitatis point of view, certainly not a good thing, but then neither is religious warfare. The Spanish Catholic defenders of it the Inquisition can at least make a case that millions died in Germany in the Thirty Years' War, which was to some extent certainly a religious war, and tens of thousands died in religious conflict in France and England in the 16th and 17th centuries. Spain never suffered this kind of wholesale slaughter in the name of God. Even Protestant historians estimate the number of those burned at the stake in Spain at less than the number of alleged witches burned at the stake elsewhere. And as we'll see shortly, most of Spain's greatest artists and writers flourished at the time when the Inquisition was at its most powerful. A two quoque argument like this serves, if not certainly to exculpate the Inquisition, at least to help keep things in perspective. Here's a portrait of Isabella in the Capella Real in Granada. One could argue that by the time the Renaissance started in Spain, with El Greco and Cervantes near the end of the 16th century, it was pretty much over everywhere else. 
There was no great sculptor or painter in Spain circa 1500, but this is probably by Diego de Siloué, who was at least an important architect and sculptor at the time. Surprisingly and inconsistently with the appearance of this work, she is said to have had blue eyes and chestnut to reddish hair. It is usual to regard Isabella as the more tolerant and statesperson-like half of the duarchy that ran Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, although she certainly did, like Ferdinand, approve of the Inquisition, and Torquemada and then Cisneros were her confessors. This is weighed against her in a recent campaign to have her recognized as a saint. Here's the portrait of Ferdinand, which is with that of Isabella in the Capella Real in Granada. No one has ever tried to make Ferdinand out a saint, and it tells you something about him to know that Machiavelli called him the foremost prince in Christendom. He was famous for his unscrupulous political maneuvering and is said to have boasted that he deceived Louis XII of France 12 times. He deceived Isabella at least five times because he had at least five illegitimate children. Prima facie, one might suppose that the complicated arrangement which in some ways unified Castile and Aragon and in some ways didn't, would have doomed any marriage between the two sovereigns of the, the places, but in fact the arrangement worked pretty well. The main reason for this is probably just that Ferdinand and Isabella shared a common outlook. At least there were certainly no public displays of disagreement to worry the citizens. As I said, the period of the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella is not a great age in the history of Spanish art, but in 1496 they commissioned a colossal altarpiece in honor of the marriages of their son Juan to Margaret, the daughter of the Emperor Maximilian of Habsburg, and their daughter Juana, known as Juana la Loca, to Maximilian's son Philip, known as Philip the Handsome. This altarpiece, like many such things, was composed of many individual panels, and you see one of them now, the Annunciation, in the San Francisco Palace of the Legion of Honor. The artist is unknown, but it is thought to have been painted by a Flemish artist, or possibly by a Spaniard under Flemish influence. As we'll see a bit later this quarter, the marriage of Juana de Philip eventually led to the acquisition of the Low Countries by Spain. And Philip II will import Flemish art by the boatload in the 16th century. This is sort of a foreshadowing of the Spanish interest in that kind of thing. Even something we take for granted as so quintessentially Spanish as flamenco may have been imported from Flanders. Flamenco means Flemish after all. the adoration of the shepherds or nativity from the altarpiece of the race catolicos as it's called the more important of these marriages at the time seemed to the spanish anyway to be that of juan to margaret juan was heir to the spanish throne juan on the other hand was going away probably never expecting to see spain again to be the wife of the heir to the habsburg empire in central and eastern europe the San Francisco Chronicle once conducted a poll, the purpose of which was to determine what the most traumatic social experiences are, and the results showed that going on a blind date ranked number two, and the 17-year-old Juana, who was not the most stable personality anyway, was not just going on a blind date, this was blind marriage. I might just add parenthetically that number one on the Chronicle list, the most traumatic thing was found to be speaking in public. Be that as it may, Juana's apprehension might have been allayed by the fact that her husband was to be the man considered the handsomest alive, the Brad Pitt of his day. The wedding was supposed to take place in the Cathedral of Antwerp, but Juana, on meeting handsome Philip, asked if the ceremony couldn't be performed sooner than that, and it was. Philip's effect on women is supposed to have been so devastating that I'm always a little reluctant to even show you his picture. But if you've composed yourself, uh, I'll show it now. Here he is with Juana 
in stained glass in the Cathedral of Antwerp where the wedding was supposed to take place. You can't see him too well here, but he, he does look good. Now, the very next year, this marriage suddenly acquired much more political importance because back in Spain, while he was at the University of Salamanca, as we've heard, Juan died, which then left Juana the heir to Spain. Regardless of how personally attractive Philip found Juana, this certainly certainly made her more politically attractive to him. He saw himself becoming not only Holy Roman Emperor, but King of Spain as well. When Isabella died in 1504, things became very complicated because Ferdinand claimed to have the right to continue his rule in Castile, whereas his son-in-law Philip claimed that he and Juana should now take over. Ferdinand had never been that popular in Castile, and there was widespread opposition there to his assumption that it would be business as usual, even without Isabella. There could well have been a civil war over this, but in 1506, Philip the Handsome died at 28 of dissipation, it is said. In any case, here's an anonymous portrait of Juana herself now. As I mentioned, mentioned, she was not known for her stability, and her marriage to Philip was rocky from the start. They had six children in ten years, but this did not slow her handsome husband's pursuit of other women. The standard view is that after Philip's death, she went over the edge, refusing to leave the body and then insisting on accompanying the coffin in a macabre journey from Burgos to Granada. This all helped bolster Ferdinand's case that she was too hypersensitive, incompetent to rule, and that he would have to act as regent for her in Castile. She was placed under virtual house arrest at Tordesillas in 1509 and spent the rest of her life there. Just how insane she really was is hard to know, and it has been alleged that Ferdinand exaggerated the seriousness of her illness to further his own ambition. This was certainly not beyond him. Her son, Carlos I of Spain, better known as the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, is also accused of having kept her locked up for similar reasons. The bottom line may well be that she was not of strong mental constitution and could not have reigned effectively, but at the same time it's hard to excuse the treatment of her by the three men in her life who should have been most considerate, her father, her husband, and her son. Juana lived until 1555 when she died and was buried next to Philip in the Capilla Real in Granada, which you see now. Ferdinand and Isabella are also buried here, and Enrique de Egas was in charge of the whole chapel project. But the gisants, the reclining tomb figures of Juana and Philip on the right, were made by the Spanish sculptor Bartolome Ordonez. Here are the tombs of Ferdinand and Isabella by the Italian Fancelli. The joke the tour guides always tell here is that Isabella's head sinks into the pillow because her head is full of weighty thoughts, matters of state, Latin conjugations, and so on, whereas Ferdinand seems to float on top as light as a feather, since inside it there are only girls' phone numbers and things like that. Ferdinand was, in fact, however, a very shrewd character and needed to be to navigate through all the challenges of his career and come out on top. When he died in 1516, his 16-year-old grandson, Charles, the oldest son of Philip and Juana, was proclaimed King of Spain. In the Prado now, this is Titian's famous portrait of Charles, who also inherited the Holy Roman Empire then when his grandfather on his mother's side, Maximilian, died in 1519. We've heard quite a bit about him already in past quarters. We've heard about his coronation in Aachen, and about his meeting with Luther at the Diet of Worms, about his wars with Francis I and his opposition to Henry VIII's divorce from his, Charles's aunt, Catherine of Aragon, the younger sister of Juana la Loca, and so on. 
He was never very popular in Spain and spent little time there. The Spanish viewed him as essentially a foreigner who just wanted to exploit them for his own good. On paper, he was the most powerful man in the world at times, ruling not only most of continental Europe, but the Americas and the Philippines. The sun always shone on his empire before it never set on the English one. In 1555, however, worn out after 35 years of emperoring, he began a complicated abdication that ultimately left the empire to his brother Ferdinand and Spain along with the Low Countries, the Americas, and parts of Italy to his son Philip. Charles then retired to the monastery of Yuste, west of Madrid, to spend the rest of his life. Few men in history with as much power as Charles V have been able to give it all up like this. The only really comparable example perhaps is that of Diocletian, who came to prefer gardening to government. Historians have been puzzled ever since about his decision to attach the Low Countries to Spain in the division of his property. Whatever his reasons may have been, this arrangement presented his son Philip with a real challenge, as we'll soon see. At Juste, Charles himself spent much of his time in prayer before the Trinity by Titian, called La Gloria by the Spanish. We saw the original last quarter, it's now in the Prado, but a copy occupies its place in the chapel. Okay, after the break, we'll hear about Philip II, the Escorial Cervantes, and begin the career of El Greco.